great to have so many alumni come back to college. We miss all of you very much. We can't all be at the conference, and I know Tony in particular won't be able to come. Tony, did you want to talk to him? Yeah, that's a real shame because I would have loved to renew uh, contacts with, with so many different people, and that I should, I really hope to be at the next event like this. But I'm, I'm out in Singapore as you watch this, um, teaching a short module on, on Calvin's Institutes, in fact. So that'll be fun, but I, I, I'm very sorry I won't be with you. Calvin's Institutes. This part of the thing of the conference is um, celebrating the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. Is that something, to, is that an anniversary of Calvin's or someone else's? Well, as I expect everybody knows, everybody should know by now. Uh, 500 years ago on um, October the 30th, you know, <laughs> October, October the 30th, um, 1517, uh, Luther did or did not post his theses up on the door of the Carson Church at, uh, uh, at Wittenberg. So that's what's being celebrated all around Europe. And in a sense, that's the starting pistol for the Reformation. Did or did not? There's some doubt about it? That, that's Tony. I'm, I, I always assumed that he had. But... Well, he, he published them. He, yes. uh, whether he actually nailed them onto the castle door is disputed, but not really, it doesn't really matter. I mean, he wrote them and they were very quickly um, published in the, you know, by publishers and circulated and, and, and then the controversy all began. Was that document intended to reform the church or to challenge the church? Uh, so neither, really, because um, he'd put out some theses earlier which were yeah. intended to sort of... Uh, bring a radical reform of, of, of theology, uh, and these were largely ignored. Um, but then the, the 95 Theses, is because, well, it's because it was to do with money, you see, because he was questioning the sending of money from Germany back to Rome with indulgences. And then, of course, the church was a bit concerned about that because it didn't want their money cut off. So um, that's what made it, made it explosive. Um, putting the Theses on the road, as I'm sure many of you know already, wasn't a sort of act of revolution. It was like putting a note, something up on the notice board saying, we're going to have a seminar on this topic. It was, it was a regular way of announcing a disputation. So there's nothing revolutionary in the idea of putting theses on the door. It wasn't some great act of defiance or anything like that. Protest? Protestant? Was it <laughs> ah, protest? I think I mean, the, the 95 theses, which are quite dull in my opinion, but they, they, they are an act of protest against... Uh, an element of late medieval Catholic theology, which had been questioned for a, for a time. It wasn't a particularly new issue that uh, anybody was going to be questioning this. Um, yeah, so I think, I think it was an act of, of protest, and there's an interesting question about what it actually sparks in terms of how the papacy responds to, to Luther, how Luther responds to the papacy, and how the group known as the Reformers respond to each other, which is all over the place. Well, when I... Um Shortly after I became a Christian, about, you know, not too long after, I read the 95 Theses, and it shocked me. They really shocked me, and almost, I wouldn't say they shook my faith, but they made me, you know, ask a whole lot of questions, because I couldn't believe how Roman Catholic they are. Mm -hmm. You know, it assumes the power of the Pope, the existence of purgatory, and if you're looking for the 95 Theses to get pure Protestant teaching, then forget it. <laughs> uh, it's a very Catholic document, but beginning to ask questions, and... and and it's, it's like with a sweater where you've got a loose bit of uh, wool. You know, it's beginning to pull at the wool. And of course, an awful lot unravels, unravels later on. But initially, I think most Protestants reading it would be quite sort of shocked to see just how Catholic they are. In, in you know, how much of Catholic theology is as yet unquestioned. I mean, the, the, the central core of what's happening is, this is the, the point that encapsulates the great epistemological shift in, in church thinking. Where, where does meaning come from? I mean, it's, the, the Renaissance has, has affected this with the, the humanist agenda of taking authority in various areas, particularly in, in philosophy and law and stuff, away from the church and putting it into ancient writers. And there have been bubbling effects in, in Wycliffe and in Huss and in various others of saying, well, actually, we don't simply accept what the church teaches us. We have a beginnings of a right to question it. So instead of Protestants... Should we be called something like critical thinkers or something? Is that really what it was doing, was beginning to ask, to do critical thinking and ask questions? Well, scholastic theology was capable yes. of critical thinking. I mean, the, the word that they chose, actually, I think, would have been uh, evangelical. 
because the word Protestant only yeah. originates in the late 1520s and was about a protest about one particular item and later on stuck as a term. Um, evangelical is saying back to the gospel, and that's precisely what they all, uh, where they all put the emphasis. This and it wasn't a negative initially, was it? I mean, mm. the, the, the initial use of the word evangelical goes back to, to 15th century Benedictines, mm. who were particularly fervent and personal in their faith, and it was a positive, and then its initial application to Luther was actually positive, and then it got twisted, as these things do, into a criticism of him because it was stating um, away from the authority of the church, away from the one body, it's, it's a separation. Well, that leads me to another question. What we've got now is not Lutherans and Catholics, but all these crazy sects and cults like Baptists and so on. Was the Reformation a good thing or was it a bad thing? <laughs> was it a good thing? Of course, 1066 and all that um, yes. brings everything down to good or bad. <laughs> uh -huh, and yes. then, of course, we know from reality that, uh, that most things are mixed. Um, was, you know, the Reformation brought, I think, many good things, but yes. it also brought bad things. What are some of the bad things? What well, it split the church. So right. the ch there was one church. Uh, now, if you go to some places in, in the West in particular, you can you know, you could go to a city and, and find perhaps 200 different different churches. Not, I don't mean different buildings, I mean different yeah. denominations or, 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 or independent churches and, yeah. and, and so on. So the whole idea of the unity of the church has, has the Reformation has, has, has sundered that in a bad way. And I think the great image that I love of the church is the one body image. Mm. And if you, you think of the uh, modern evangelical wing as being activists as it, its key aspect, so it's much more like a hand, whereas uh, perhaps the the more contemplative um, orders and, and denominations are, are perhaps more the, the head or, or the heart or something else. And what you've actually got for a lot of history since the Reformation is, is the hand punching the head and the heart and various other bits. Uh, and that's a, that's a slightly strange concept. And my, my concern is, is the, that the mission of the church is affected because if you look at somebody beating themselves up, then you're not going to be enamoured to them and, and unfortunately that's one of the things which has happened. There's been too little humility from every section of the church. So what are the good things? This sounds well, reform was, reform was necessary. The late medieval church, um, the balance between uh, scripture and faith and, uh, and tradition had become Im imbalanced um, and there was a real need um, because the church is made up of, of fallen humans uh, and particularly the highest positions in the church associated with power and wealth uh, attracted people who wanted power and wealth rather than necessarily the great spiritual leaders. Um, that's true of every uh, denomination, unfortunately. Um, and so in all sorts of areas, the church had gone uh, off kilter, away from its, its roots and its, its core teachings, and there was a desperate need for reform. You see this in, uh, you're on, about 100 years previously, there'd been a, a period known as the Concilia Papacy, where the, the popes, uh, after the, the papal split, the popes had been very much lowered in their their power and decisions have been made in council rather than by individuals and a lot of reforms have been made at that point. A lot of abuses in the church have been corrected for a time but unfortunately the popes regained power in the, the late 15th century. Politics comes into it in a whole new new way and um, you get the old Constantine debate of whether Christendom at all is a, is a good mm. thing. Anything else good about it? <laughs> well I think the fundamental issue of the Reformation which underlies everything else, is the question of authority. Uh, basically, um, does the church define what is the gospel and then you have to interpret the Bible in the light of what the church says, or can we question what the church says in the, in the light of the Bible? And the reformers say basically the, the, the latter. And uh, Roman Catholics today, uh, the Roman Catholic Church is much more open to the corrective role of Scripture than it was or has been in, in the past, but it's still a fundamental issue. Mm -hmm. And if you want it clarified, then I think, what, you know, if ever I begin to sort of... Questions about that, I just think about the Marian doctrines. Mm -hmm. the, the, the Mary was conceived, uh, had an immaculate conception, that Mary is assumed body and soul into heaven. These have been defined by an infallible Pope, these are dogmas which are irreformable for the Roman Catholic Church. Um, for Protestants, uh, for evangelicals, doctrine should be tested by scripture, and, and I think those doctrines are a million miles of scripture. Uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's the good side. The bad side, of course, 
is, and this is not mm. at all what the reformers intended, but the outcome was, uh, and I've heard it said just actually in the last few weeks, um, well, the Reformation is about everyone becoming their own pope, and that's precisely the problem, because every idiot thinks they can set themselves up as an infallible teacher. Um, and that's, of course, where all the splits come. It began yeah. as a united movement, and then Luther and Swingley didn't quite see eye to eye over the Lord's Supper, and so you have two, and then, well, the rest is history. And, and the experience of the earliest church, of course, the reason why they wanted to draw everything together uh, around doctrines was because in, in the earliest church there was a great problem of what they called, what we call heresy, but teachings that were dangerous to people's salvation, and they wanted to protect salvation because if you allow people just to, to work with Scripture and come up with their own ideas, you have areas saying, well, Jesus isn't actually God at all. He's just a, a, a bloke because that's the only way it works. And so the church says, well, no, we, we've created these teachings in order to help people to have a faith that is constructive uh, and spiritually motivated and all of this kind of stuff. But you do have in, in the Catholic Church the addition of all sorts of, of extra stuff, which in Orthodox you don't have, of course. All Orthodox teaching is, is limited to that which was agreed in the whole council. Um, and the high view of the church that the Catholics have becomes a bind to them. So as soon as uh, a statement is made by a pope or, or by a council of the Catholic church, you can't really go back on it. Um, not because you don't recognise that it was wrong what happened, but if you say that an error was made by the church in the past, what you're saying is that the body of Christ, inhabited by the spirit of Christ, has made an error. And so you're not blaming the popes for it, you're blaming the, you know, to say the, the Holy Spirit got it wrong. And they're not willing to do that. And there's, there's something to admire in that whilst recognising that it's a bind that is ultimately... But they are very, very capable of, re of redefining doctrine. They yes, to, yeah. They keep the outward word, so exactly. outside the church, no salvation. Yeah. But of course, sincere Hindus yeah. are saved and so on. Yeah. Authority in politics. <laughs> well, yeah. the theme of this conference is not just the Reformation, but narrowing down to faith alone, which I know is one of the cries of the of the Reformation. If, if, if authority is the main issue, surely faith is, is a response to authority. It, 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 so It's a response to revelation. And, and then there's a, there's a need, well, I think humans have a need to, to seek to organize that revelation, to think constructively about it, so, so that faith doesn't become into you know, pure blue sky thinking. Um, and, and therefore, it's a case of faith in God, yes, but how do we gain a faith in God? It's through the revelation of God, and that revelation is through creation, through Christ, through spirit, through church, through, through self. Um, and where are you order, ordering those uh, elements of how revelation comes to the individual, becomes a key aspect? And then what is the, the evidence of that work? Um, this is where the book of James, you know, without... Faith without deeds is, is useless. So the Reformation was different. The, the Protestants are different to the Catholics. In, the, in, in how they see the authority of the, of the uh, revelatory, the organisation, if you like, of, of revelationary proof. But when, when we say faith alone, of course, yeah. well, well, two things. First of all, faith alone really is a slogan of the Reformation. Hmm. Already before 1520, it's become a slogan. Scripture alone is a, is a post-Reformation slogan, although it sums up what they were about, but it wasn't a slogan in Reformation times. But faith alone definitely was, and was highly controverted. But when they said faith alone, they weren't meaning um, believing the Bible. They were meaning the faith we're talking about here is a saving faith in Christ. Yeah. Um, so it's focused on that. And Calvin, interestingly, says uh, it's not enough to believe the Bible is an infallible oracle unless you have a sort of personal trust in Christ, a faith that, uh, you know, a lively faith that, 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 that leads to good works and so on. Well, I definitely want to talk more about that, but <laughs> we'll do that in our next video. Thanks for listening.